Um, it's my great pleasure to uh, introduce as our next speaker, Dr. Michael Carpenter, uh, who is a Senior Director of the Penn Biden Center for Diplomacy and Global Engagement, uh, and also a non-resident senior fellow at the Atlantic Council. Um, he has previously served uh, in the uh, Pentagon, uh, and also as a foreign policy advisor to Vice President uh, Joe Biden, which is when I first had the, the pleasure of meeting him. Uh, so uh, let me hand over straight away to, uh, to Michael to give us uh, the, the view of a, a high-level U.S. foreign policy uh, practitioner on the Ukraine situation. Great. Thank you. Thank you very much, Neil. And I appreciate the opportunity to be here. I think I, I hope I bring a little bit of a different perspective as a, a former Pentagon official. Uh, I'm sure that's not the usual type of person who addresses this crowd. Uh, but let me bring you a little bit of, of sort of where I see uh, Washington and other uh, European Western capitals uh, looking at Ukraine and, and what the sort of consensus views are, or at least uh, what some of the views maybe not consensus are. Um, as a Pentagon official, of course, I look at March of 2018 and I think, you know, Ukraine has been at war for four years now. So the question that I ask is, well, after four years of war, uh, is Ukraine winning or losing? And I think it's a difficult question to answer, but I think you have to break it down and look down at what specifically are you talking about. Um, on the one hand, uh, Ukraine is fighting a war for its sovereignty and territorial integrity. At the same time, it is reforming its institutions of governance, its economy, in order to build a more prosperous state and keep open the possibility of a European future. And then thirdly, it is fighting a war against corruption internally. And I think it's important to disaggregate those three aspects of the transformation that Ukraine is undergoing and the challenges that it faces. And the way I see it, frankly, is Ukraine is winning on the first of these challenges. It is doing well. It is making slow but steady progress on the second. And it is failing on the third. And this is counterintuitive because you would expect that a country that is at war with a nuclear superpower would not necessarily be winning. You would expect that a country that is trying to attract foreign investment at a time of crisis as it is fighting a war would have a very difficult time of implementing reforms and moving forward. But you would also expect that four years after a revolution where corruption was a central issue and where there is a societal consensus on fighting corruption and where you don't necessarily need outside help to fight that fight, that you would have more progress than we've seen today. And yet that's where Ukraine finds itself today. I think the good news here is that the government has within its power the ability to change that equation. The bad news is that Russia is looking at these vulnerabilities and is seeking to manipulate them to its own <coughs> advantage. What is, after all, the Kremlin's goal in Ukraine? The Kremlin looks at this much as a feudal empire looks at a neighboring kingdom. Putin wants control of Ukraine. He doesn't want necessarily control of territory. He wants Ukraine's leaders to pledge allegiance to the Tsar. And so, in order to do that, he knows he can't control Ukraine directly. He cannot control the population. He saw when he invaded four years ago that there was widespread resistance from within Ukrainian society. In fact, Ukrainian society has never been more united in its national aspirations and its resistance to foreign occupation as it is today. And so the only way that Putin can realize his goal of controlling Ukraine is through proxies. He uses proxies in the Donbass, but more importantly, he wants to use proxies throughout the rest of Ukraine. And those proxies are oligarchs 
and influential people in business and politics. And that is his strategy for controlling Ukraine. Giving up Ukraine is not an option for the Kremlin. Much as I value the efforts of my colleague and friend Kurt Volker to try to find a solution in his talks with Vladislav Surkov, and as much as I think it is valuable to delineate what a meaningful peacekeeping operation in the Donbass would look like, frankly, I think it's a pipe dream. I think there is no chance that Putin will allow for a peacekeeping operation, a meaningful peacekeeping operation, not a bunch of guys running around along the line of contact that are unarmed and that don't do anything significant. But the notion that he will allow a meaningful peace operation to be put in place means he gives up hope of controlling Ukraine, which is his goal. So that's not going to happen. So what is Ukraine's strategy then in response to this goal of internal subversion from the Kremlin? Well, I think Ukraine has to play the long game here. I don't think that you need to reconquer the Donbass or think about retaking Crimea in the near term. We just recently celebrated the anniversary of the Welles Declaration which held in place for 50 years the principle of non-recognition of the Baltic states. And eventually, that principle, adhered to methodically and consistently by every single US administration, Democrat or Republican, over decades, saw the light of day as the Baltic states gained their independence. But what Ukraine does need to do today is it does need to defend against Russian aggression and against Russian subversion. As I said, from my former Pentagon perspective, I think Ukraine is doing a good job of defending against Russian aggression in the Donbass. I think the Ukrainian military has come a long way. They are much more capable. They are organized more efficiently, although there is still a long way to go in terms of defense reform. And they are able to hold the line, and that is important. But where Putin is doubling down now is not on aggression in the Donbass. That will continue. Don't get me wrong, there are Ukrainians dying every day in the Donbass. But Putin, if you sit in the Kremlin, your goal right now is to double down on subversion. Look at what Putin did in the United States. Look at what he's doing in Western European countries. This is the playbook now. It's not just cyber, energy blackmail, disinformation. It's all of those things. But it's also weaponizing corruption to penetrate political and economic elites to achieve his desired outcomes. And that is very much the strategy here. It's the strategy here, it's the strategy in the Western Balkans, it's the strategy in Western Europe. And the only thing that prevents this strategy from succeeded, succeeding excuse me, is one thing, it's establishing rule of law. And rule of law is, not only is it the ticket to the success of countries that have transitioned from uh, the Soviet period to EU-NATO membership, like for example the Baltic states, or Poland or Romania, but it is a ticket to building resilience against the vulnerabilities that Putin and other uh, members of the Kremlin seek to exploit. And that is where Ukraine's focus today needs to be. Of course, this focus has been there all along. I remember working with uh, members of the Commerce Department to uh, put together a U.S.-Ukraine investment forum in July of 2015, where we had a number of speakers come and talk about the importance of rule of law and the importance of reforms. As I'm sure you've heard at this conference every year, probably since the conference was founded. And I remember one of the most 
eloquent speakers at that U.S.-Ukraine investment forum was a guy named uh, Roman Nasirov. Spoke fluent English, um, delivered a very compelling presentation on the need to reform the tax and customs service. And I remember thinking, this is, this is very credible, this is, this is very appropriate, this is exactly what Ukraine needs. Now, I raise his case not because of the individual, because I don't know him at all. But I raise the case because there is so much of talking the talk, and where we really need to see results is on walking the walk. And it primarily has to do with the fight against corruption. <laughs> You've seen reforms that have been implemented that have been largely successful. Healthcare has moved a long way. Administrative reform. We heard earlier just now about the possibilities for agricultural reform, pension reform, defense reform is moving along. I was heavily involved in helping the Ministry of Defense to craft that effort. Uh, decentralization is moving along. But all of this will it's not that it won't amount to anything. It is significant. It is progress. Too many people in Western European capitals don't understand how difficult and how much reform has been accomplished. And that story needs to be told, and it's important. But I'm telling you the perspective from Washington that I see is that these reforms get lost when Americans look at Ukraine and say, so how many high-level officials from the Yanukovych era have been prosecuted for corruption? Not just from the Yanukovych era, from any era. And that's where the metrics don't look as compelling. And, you know, as well as Ukraine has done, and I'm, you know, I'm a, I, I guess I'm more of a glass half full guy, but as much as Ukraine has done, frankly, the current situation of moving forward slowly but steadily with reforms, from my perspective, is not sufficient. Two to three percent growth, frankly, won't work if the strategy is to outlast Putin's game of subversion. Playing brinksmanship with the IMF program is not gonna work. Being ranked 130th out of 180 countries on Transparency International's corruption index isn't going to work. Now, I say this not to be pessimistic because, as I said, there is a lot of great reform, great reformers and great reform efforts that are moving forward. But all of this hinges on having a working system of fighting corruption. And to fight corruption, you have to not just design the institutions, whether it's the health care system or whether it's the custom system that provide fewer opportunities for corruption and corrupt actors to, to engage in, in bribes and graft, but it's fundamentally going after these actors with a credible, independent law enforcement system and a judiciary that will be insulated from political pressures. And that's why this whole debate over the last three or four months about NABU and having political independence for NABU is so important and for the anti-corruption courts. Venice Commission is nice bureaucratic talk, but I personally, and people in Washington and most Western European capitals, don't care so much about the Venice Commission. They care about having an institution that is free from political pressures, from the government, from the presidential administration, or from anyone else. That is what matters. And until Ukraine gets that right, I'm sorry, but the rest is going to be very, very difficult to put together. And you can argue that Ukraine can muddle through that the next few years, reforms will continue. But I'm telling you, Putin has a strategy of subversion, and you've got elections coming up in 2019 that provide ample opportunities for him to seek to undermine this democracy, which is a democracy. 
and which is moving forward. But if that opportunity is presented to have oligarchs come in and change the nature of the system such that there is more influence from the Kremlin in this country, then those reforms won't succeed. And so my I don't like the debate about whether the glass is half full and, or half empty because I think it's fruitless. But what I think the message that I'm trying to convey is you don't have as much time as you think you have. You have to act now. Reforms need to be accelerated. Difficult decisions need to be made. It's politically risky for some. But frankly, if the next elections go to populists, and we see the swan song of populism gaining traction across Europe and North America and beyond, then this country is in trouble. And frankly, voters are rational. Voters look at the pro-Russian Yanukovych government and they see it was corrupt and it didn't deliver for them. But if they look at pro-Western politicians and parties and a pro-Western government, and they see that it doesn't deliver for them, they're going to draw the same conclusion and they're going to vote for an alternative. That's the rational thing to do when you're a voter. You can say people succumb to populism, but that's the rational impulse. And so to convince the voters to secure the reforms, to allow for the investors in this room to be able to put your money into Ukraine, everything needs to be accelerated with a focus first and foremost, reform number one, Number two and number three need to be anti-corruption. And I am an advocate of getting the EU more into the game, getting the US as well. This administration has not been nearly as active on Ukraine as the last one. But I am an advocate for having the EU put its money where its mouth is, develop an EU investment fund for Ukraine that invests in companies that are willing to do corporate governance reform. Put, make the money conditional on specific benchmarks like the ones that the IMF has laid out. And let the market speak to politicians and let the market incentivize reforms. Because right now, frankly, a lot of politicians, especially in the RADA, don't see the incentives for, for voting for reforms when they have an interest, a vested interest, in the status quo. So the EU has a role to play. I wish the US administration would play a greater role in terms of supporting the reform efforts at a higher level, putting the pressure on Ukraine's leaders to keep moving forward. But you in the business community and in civil society, and those of you in government, also need to take the, the bull by the horns and move forward right now because time is limited. You are doing well. There are so many incredibly talented Ukrainian reformers here. People like former Minister Abramovicius, those in government today, the acting Minister of Health who I met, who I was so deeply impressed with, everything she's trying to do. There are lots of people like that. I could go on and on. There are plenty of great reformers in senior levels. But again, until the corruption piece is solved, Putin, who's not winning right now, may still have a chance. You can't give him that chance. Thanks. That's my prepared remarks, and I'm happy to take questions.